All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's session, Innovate to Build the New Frontier of Sustainable Construction, a step-by-step -step roadmap for ESG. My name is Misty Scott and I am pleased to be your moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Tommy is the CEO of Green Badger. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. And for those attending, feel free to drop your questions in the live chat during the presentation. We will have time to answer them at the end. Turn it on over to you. All right. Can you see my screen, hopefully? Yep. We got you. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. As mentioned, uh, we are covering here today the new frontier for sustainable construction and talking about a step-by-step -step roadmap of ESG implementation. Uh, as mentioned, I am Tommy Lindstroth. I've been in the sustainability space for going on 20 years, uh, really in a number of roles. Um, started out in real estate development. I was the director of sustainability for a developer here in the Southeast US, uh, where I was able to work on, on projects such as the, the first LEED certified shopping center in the US, the first LEED certified McDonald's, uh, all sorts of cool projects. Um, I took those lessons, moved into consulting, helped a bunch of other people implement sustainability into both their organization and their uh, design and construction projects. Uh, and then uh, transitioned into technology, where as mentioned, I'm the founder of Green Badger. Green Badger is a software platform built to streamline and automate green construction compliance. Uh, we've had the privilege of working with over 1,800 project teams, big and small, everything from office fit outs all the way to SeaTac and JFK airports to help ensure sustainability requirements are met, while also uh, cumulatively reducing tens of thousands of hours of time that are spent normally in these processes. And it's really uh, an important space because uh, construction as a whole is a growing industry uh, and commercial construction is large as it's been. Uh, and to, to, to shamelessly steal a quote from Vanessa Bertolini from Autodesk that there's a need to build 13,000 13, buildings each day between now and 2050 to support an expected population of 7 billion people living in cities. 13,000 a day for the next 25 years. That is a, a lot of buildings. And the choices we make about those buildings and how we design and specifically how we construct those buildings today are gonna impact our communities and environment for decades. They're, they're, those buildings are not going anywhere. And so we really need to, to choose wisely how we, are, how we are designing and building those buildings. Um, the good news, in my opinion anyway, is that green construction is as prevalent today as it ever has been. Um, in fact, green construction makes up now about 40% of the total construction market space. And this number itself is doubled. It was only 20% uh, 15, 20 years ago. So the, the portion of projects that are choosing to incorporate sustainability is growing uh, as part of the overall, overall construction marketplace. And you see this in the growth of LEED and WELL and other green building rating systems. LEED uh, is now required in 90, I think 90% 90 of Fortune 100 companies use it as their uh, de facto standard of how they are going to construct buildings and nearly everything that's publicly funded from the federal side has that type of requirement. Two thirds of states, thousands of munis municipalities and institutions of higher learning um, require it. And so for the construction industry, this is just a growing contractual obligation. I mean, yes, a lot of contractors want to do it because it is the right thing to do. But it is, you know, at this point, it's, hey, the building's got to be 30 stories and you've got to track carbon and we have to have a lead. Just another part of the overall design uh, and construction obligation that's in the plans and in the specs and has to be done. So same as, you know, now there again, we've, we've got sustainability and it's competing with time with scheduling and safety and supply chain and every other complication of building a building. And again, we're only beginning to see more of these requirements and what we're gonna be talking about today because increasingly ESG reporting is becoming necessary um, in some form or function. And it's a, it's a broad term we'll get to in a second, but you know, I talked to contractors 
every day uh, and all the time. They are now getting ESG and sustainability questionnaires as part of the RFQ process. I was talking to a general contractor a week and a half ago and asked, and last year alone, um, they got 100, 100 uh, sustainability surveys that were part of their qualification process that they've got to dictate answer how are they how are they incorporating these processes into their own operations and while today those tend to be informative uh, and when i was working in that world you know step one is yes we're going to ask you what you're doing but step two is those responses soon become part of your selection criteria and those that have stronger responses to that are going to be higher up uh, that's already used in the world of safety today, where your overall safety score could uh, prohibit you from being even qualified to bid on work. And this is looks like it's following that same path. You've got a lot of the pharmaceutical companies and Amazons and Microsofts that are already actively requiring general contractors to track carbon throughout the construction process, uh, because frankly, it becomes a scope three emission for them. If that building wasn't built, that carbon wouldn't have been emitted. And so they have matured to the point in their own programs that now they are looking at supply chain and construction just becomes another part of that for them. So you've got clients demanding it, but we're also starting to see increasing regulatory pressure. A year and a half, two years ago, the SEC proposed regulations for publicly traded companies that they disclose carbon emissions. The Inflation Reduction Act calls for any company doing more than seven and a half million dollars of business with the government to report, report scope one and scope two emissions. For a general contractor, that could literally be one construction project and that would trigger them to report for their entire company um, for that just because they have that one, the one project that they want. Um, and on top of that, we're seeing growing states pushing it. California this year passed legislation, legislation requiring general contractors of a certain size to report on both embodied carbon of a certain number of materials, as well as the operational carbon during construction. So the issue is real and it's beginning to make an impact in the industry in a, in a pretty significant way. So I've been throwing the term ESG around a lot. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be wa willing to wager in the audience, we've got people that uh, are neck deep in it and some of this might be new for, so I'm gonna take just one minute and really cover the very basics. Um, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governments, which return, refers to really a set of metrics used to evaluate a business. Uh, traditionally, it's been long used in the real estate world to evaluate which assets may be preferable for, for acquisition, but it goes beyond looking at just a financial performance uh, of a building or an organization. And this slide has a few examples of the type of metrics within ESG, um, but I want to start with a caveat because a lot of times the E is all that gets talked about, the environmental side of things. Um, under this category, you, know, you have energy consumption, emissions, waste management, water. And so far, all of the uh, regulations I spoke about are, 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 are live there. It's on carbon reporting, which coincides with energy consumption. Um, but really, it is, it is much broader than that. Social includes diversity, equity, and inclusion health and well-being of workers and occupants, philanthropy and plenty of other metrics. Safety is in there. Governance relates to company policies, ethics, codes of conduct. Um, indeed though, many of these are nothing new, right? There's plenty of construction projects that require things like minority and women reporting for subcontractors, um, ESG or CSR or whatever you wanna call it here. It really is just a means to aggregate, to track, and then to improve on all of these various measures. So really, it's a, it's a means to an end to stop looking at these things in very siloed functions and to take a more comprehensive view of an organization to see how they're performing and where there's room for improvement. But to me, uh, and again, I maybe coming from the consulting world, ESG is, is something else. And I think as you're starting to see here, it's really, to me, it's a business strategy. It's a strategy that, if executed correctly, can help you do a number of things, including win more work, retaining and attracting top talent, all of which help ensure a company's long-term success. But like any business strategy, it requires thoughtful planning and execution. Uh, a GC wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to go enter a new market or a new sector uh, without understanding the competitive landscape, without a team in place to win business and then to execute projects on that business, without funding and human capital to build a book of business, 
And you shouldn't uh, approach ESG as a business strategy without a similar thought process. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. How as a company, uh, specifically in the construction world, you can set up a successful ESG program within your organization, understanding that everybody's at a different point of their of their journey. And some people are just getting started. Some people are neck deep. Some are really advanced. There's a number of drivers behind why we see companies implementing ESG programs. Um, and the first one that comes up, and I've already alluded to it, it's because our clients are asking us about it. I'm sure there's plenty of people attending today that have been, again, starting to see their own questions from their clients. And it could be you know, a full-on sustainability questionnaire. Like I mentioned, we're starting to see contractors getting, or it could just be general questions about, you know, what are your waste reduction strategies or how do you track carbon? There's a, a good chance that if they're asking those questions, it's likely a gauge of your efforts, you know, to understand what your company is doing or can do um, and maybe a precursor before, you know, they, they hit you with that full on sustainability survey for your company. Um, you know, and we're in the general contracting world, we're in the service industry. You know, if they want us to track carbon and report it, we will do it. Uh, it's just, you know, a matter of a matter of again being part of that contractual contractual obligation. Um, on the other hand, you know, there's some people you might not have seen these requirements yet, but uh, we've got early adopters who are who are really hearing the buzz and seeing the writing on the wall. I can't, you know, if you walk into a meeting and uh, somebody asks you, "Hey, how are you planning on doing these things?" and you don't have a great answer, you know, that might affect your likelihood to win that work. So you, the early adopters, might want to ensure that when they do get this app information, they have it ready to go, uh, because as you saw, I mean, we we really feel this is coming soon and. You know, in some cases, hey, if you're being asked for it on one project, you odds are you're going to be asked on another project, you know, especially now if you're in the state of California. So early adopters have the sense that ESG is the new safety, and it's going to be required in some form or function um, really on every project. And so we better figure out a way to go ahead and, and get that all started to get figured out. Uh, and then finally, back to you know the the subject of regulations. Uh, it may soon just be the cost of doing business if you're in the public sector or, or indeed entire states. With what California and New York has something on the books, the state of Washington has something on the books. Um, and so that's the why, right? It's it, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pressures coming, and a lot of them can potentially financial. Um, but add to the how, you know, the truth is. You know, there is no one size fits all solution. What one company is doing is going to vary greatly. Uh, and that's fine. Again, people are going to be at different points of, of their uh, maturity in this. And just your, your programs are just informed by so many different things that are specific to your company. You know, your company size, your locations. Is this you know, a local company? Is it regional? Is it national or international? The type of construction work you do, building skyscrapers in downtown Manhattan is a lot different than building suburban garden style apartments um, where you've got all sorts of you know, horizontal development versus having to put 30 stories of underground parking and things of that nature. Um, so there's a lot of factors that are going to impact what your program begins to look like. And one of the challenges that we see is that there's no real defining standard. Uh, instead, there's a wide assortment of reporting options. Um, this can be a blessing you know, or a curse, depending where you are. You're not roped into one standard that dictates you must do it this way. Um, but now you've got to figure out which standard is right for you. And some of these assessments, they have hundreds or thousands of data points, which can, frankly, you open these checklists up and it can just be overwhelming. If you're just trying to get started and it's, here's the thousand things you can look at, you know, man, uh, that's that that that's often can lead to inaction because people are just like, I can't, I can't even begin to get my head around this. So personally, I would suggest only diving into these frameworks if you're further along on your ESG journey or you've got dedicated ESG uh, people or departments. Um, there is a standard that's that's not on here that if you are in construction, it's called the Contractor's Commitment, uh, which has been designed specifically for contractors at the beginning of this journey in mind and has. A very, uh, it's restricted to like six categories, a very clear cut set of requirements. So uh, contractor's commitment, if you haven't heard it, just Google it. It's a great starting point to, to begin your, your path, uh, your, your, your journey down this path. 
So the, um, as I mentioned, successful ESG programs really do need to be treated as business strategy and as such requires a team approach. You can't just like pick one person and say, hey, you've got your whole day job going on. Now go do this on the side and expect that it gets done uh, correctly or gets done at all. A lot of times, you know, you see that happen. That's that's setting programs up to fail. So if you if you want to have success, really looking at a team approach, uh, because it can't just be done by a lone individual. And you know, as mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of different aspects to it that a lot of times get siloed, right? And so by bringing those together, you're able to have collaborative efforts. Uh, hopefully, you get support and enthusiasm throughout the company executives. And you should have representation, again, from many of the departments, you know, just from some of the points we talked about earlier. You've got things like sustainability. You've got safety. You're going to have HR, legal, IT, senior leadership. All of these people have roles that are that fall into this broad, broad term we're using for ESG. So team team is definitely critical. Uh, once you get started, once you have the team in place, it's, it's time to get started. And now we like to advocate really uh, a four-step process just to help provide a framework to keep everything manageable. And the very first one is to determine your scope. Again, as I mentioned, companies are of, of all different shapes and sizes. And where do we want to start with the one main office for H HQ? Do we want to pick a region? Do we want to pick an entire organization? Are we looking in the office? Are we looking in the field? There's just a ton of options. And so step one is to really say, look, here's where we are starting. We are going to we are going to frame it uh, with this with this scope. And we're going to start here because, you know, if you try and do everything all at once, again, it's another way to to get in a little too deep, too quick. So identify what that scope is going to be uh, and use that to meet your internal goals. Uh, and certainly, again, it, it, that might be informed by a, your company, but also by clients and customer and regulatory obligations. But really, step one, we want to define what those goals are, uh, what, what that scope is, and use that as our, as our basis to move forward. Next up is to benchmark. Um, everybody, uh, I won't say everybody, lots of people, myself included, we want to jump to tactics because tactics are the fun part. It's like, hey, let's go, you know, put in EV chargers, let's go do this, let's go do that. But really, you know, you need to figure out where you're going before you can determine where you need to go. So just starting to throw tactics is like throwing darts at a dartboard. Um, you can't manage what, what you can't measure. So take that first lump of time, build your 12 to 18 months of historical data, and use that to, to dictate your benchmarking effort. Um, it doesn't have to be all done at once. You can start, you know, the first first month or two, you know, dig into your past historical energy use and then move on to water or fuel or whatever metrics you've chosen to start with. Uh, but really, really work to set a good baseline because if you don't, you don't, you don't know where to go if you don't know where you've been. So what to include in that initial benchmark is also, again, really dependent where you are on your ESG journey. And again, we take a firm view of breaking this into, into tiers to make them more manageable. Uh, the same as my prior example of a business strategy of expanding a new, a new sector, you wouldn't go out and, and say, hey, we're going to accomplish everything in year one. You know, first, you, you've got to win the first project. Then you've got to win five projects. And then you've got, you know, it's going to take you a couple of years before you get to your 50 project target. So we might have aspirational goals, but as with any strategy, we need to look at it as an evolution over time. And so we want to do the same thing with our ESG program. It's, it's no different because we're treating it as a business strategy. And so we want to start with achievable actions over what we control and then move into the more complex things uh, over what we have the ability to perhaps only, only influence. Much like we're, again, we're seeing the Amazons and the Microsofts now asking about construction. It's because they spent the time doing all of their internal things first, and now they're getting to the point where we're looking at supply chain. So we don't want to run out and start you know, beating up subcontractors for information on energy consumption before we've benchmarked our own energy consumption, for example. So for tier one, we suggest, again, I suggest starting with data sets you, have, you either have or have easy access to. For the e-metrics or environmental metrics, again, this could be the office energy use, the office water use. It could be fuel cards for vehicles, 
right? You might not have been tracking that, but you could pretty quickly go back to your fuel card and get an annual summary for the past 12 months and have a baseline of how much fuel consumption your vehicles are using. S metrics or social metrics can be company workforce makeups. It could be evaluation of wellness programs. Uh, well, governance, many companies already have these things in place. And again, it's a matter of just aggregating it and, and, check, and checking to make sure you do have codes of conduct, IT policies, ethics requirements. You know, do that. Congrats. Step one complete. You've got a benchmark of things that are within your control that you can go in and measure and make sure we have in place. For tier two, we want to start to look at uh, metrics where we can improve on, on tier one. So we want to get better and start refining uh, those early metrics that we have and then begin to expand into new, into new data sets. So we've captured our office energy use. Now maybe we start to look at things like company business travel or we do a, a, a survey of commute for our, our employees. You know, S can entail... Um, a number of other things starting to look at, you know, again, MWB participation at our job sites or trade partners, tracking company innovation, all, all sorts of things. And, and we've got a whole uh, resource we'll share with you at the end that's got just a whole bunch of options that you can start to look at for tier one, tier two and tier three metrics. You know, it might not include everything out there in the world, but again, we, we, we like helping people figure out where they should start. And so we've got a menu and really you should be picking and choosing what is right for you based on your organization. And then finally, we get to the tier three, which is even more far reaching. And these again, might start to be inf items we, we can't control, but we can begin to influence. And just like our customers are sending us those supplier surveys, we can begin to look at our subcontractors, our vendors, our procurement policies, uh, embodied carbon of materials, project-based philanthropy and wellness, other job site initiatives where, again, you might not be able to wave your, wave your fist and make it happen, but you can certainly influence what is occurring in those situations. After we've got a sense, so again, that's benchmarking. We want to look at easy, uh, and we might not even get to tier three, right? Let's start with tier one, uh, and then we can actually move into goal setting. But as we evolve, we want to look at our tier one, tier two, and our three. But after we have benchmarked, now we can begin to set goals, right? It's really tough to say, hey, I want to reduce energy by 10% if you, if you don't know uh, exactly where you're starting. So what we want to do is, is use that data to make informed decisions about our goals. Um, in this example, if a team you know, jumped straight into tactics without benchmarking and goals, they might have said, hey, we're, we want to reduce carbon emissions. Let's go track, tackle business travel. However, you know, business travel is really a small percentage of this overall carbon footprint. And if they really wanted to do it, they would target electricity use. You could set a goal to get from you know, roughly 108 tons and say, hey, we want to reduce it by 50% over five years. And then we begin to formulate tactics to help us reach that goal. We've benchmarked it. We understand what our baseline is. We've set a reduction goal. And then we're going to figure out what tactics it takes to address that goal. And uh, it's just as important to understand if you are not reaching your goal. If you have a target of 30% minority participation and you're actually tracking and measuring against that, you don't know if you're having success or if we need to change course and work back to actually improve performance. So again, it's important to bench line, benchmark up front, set our goals, and then begin to track against those goals as we move forward. Then we can start getting to... Uh, some of the fun stuff, right? Implementing tactics is uh, is is what we all like to do because that's where you actually start to, to see some of the, the success. And certainly, you know, there's tons of best practices for a lot of things. Um, again, tactics will be specifics to your goals, but this is where you start to say, hey, if we want to reduce for environmental, if we want to reduce gasoline consumption, well, maybe we build a, a phase-in approach to an EV fleet or at least start by installing EV chargers at the office. If we want to increase diversity, maybe we look at our recruiting efforts and if we're targeting women's colleges and HBCUs and pay equity and all sorts of things. Um, and with governance, again, uh, it's often seen as policy driven, but it can in it include efforts to reduce employee turnovers or satisfaction surveys and actually you know, using the results of those satisfaction surveys to implement change. Um, 
all of those good things. So there, you know, you start with your scope. We start with what we can control. We use our data to set goals. And then we implement tactics to reach those goals. Sounds pretty easy, hopefully. But of course, there is often roadblocks and challenges along the way. Um, and a big one can be, depending where your ESG drivers are, a big one can be executive buy-in without which, you know, this could really seem like flavor of the month. And I've seen this, you know, a lot in org when we did organizational consultancy. If, if it's not supported by senior leadership, it's, oh, this is just another thing we're worried about this month that we need to do in our spare time. Uh, and if we just ignore it, it'll go away uh, or nobody's empowered to actually do anything. So in this case, you know, one of the responses we have is back to this is help, helping them understand the business case for this. Clients are asking for it. It's pretty hard to argue for this one. Uh, if you can you know, quantify the numbers of RFQs you've had where they've asked you or provided these surveys, that's a pretty powerful metric. Again, when I, when I talked to a GC and they said we had 100 of these coming in, if you quantify uh, the value of construction from 100 projects, you know, what is that business opportunity to the company that if you don't have a program in place, you're, you're, you're going to challenge? If you're competing with three other GCs, would having a stronger ESG program help differentiate you, help set you apart? If the answer is, if the chance of that answer is anywhere uh, above a no, you know, it's worth looking at. Right. I think so. And then finally, the anybody who's forward looking, seeing these regulatory requirements. Yeah, I mean, it might make it a moot point. You won't have to argue it if it becomes becomes regulation. But for future business planning, being prepared for that environment just helps keep the company on track. So those are strong. They tend to be strong financial drivers that you can use for executive buy in. The next challenge we often see is that it just takes too much takes too much time. Um, it can seem overwhelming when you get started since there are just so many different metrics that fall under ESG reporting. Um, and even if you start with all of the metrics that you already control, it's still just a lot of information. Now, there are ways you can reduce this. You know, instead of tracking commute every day for employees, you can do a one-time survey and extrapolate it for the year. Uh, other metrics you might not have to report the information as much as you think. Again, for energy to get started, you can likely just get a summary from your utility for the past year to get your bench line, baseline. And then as that utility bill comes in, it takes 15 seconds to capture that data as it starts coming through. Um, and that's on top of the ways you can automate this. through. There's plenty of uh, meter reading automation and software that you know, get this off of spreadsheets pretty quickly and get it into dashboards uh, for easy reporting. So as long as you have that information available, again, it just takes you it takes you seconds per month. So this does not have to be a massive a massive time sink for anybody involved. And then finally, uh, a lack of dedicated resources. So if your company doesn't have a dedicated team or individual, this could be it could again just provide this. It could change it to be a back burner issue that people just don't feel empowered to work on because, hey, if we're not going to dedicate the time and the resources to it, we don't think that we actually care about this. So, uh, again, you can put together a team. You don't have to go out and hire an ESG uh, dedicated person. It does help to have somebody whose responsibility is coordination and figuring out how the ESG reporting gets done uh, and to help shepherd everyone together. But it, you know, it could be a single person, but certainly you need a team as we mentioned earlier, just because of the diversity of data that comes from all different parts of the organization. So when addressing these roadmaps, uh, roadblocks, again, it comes back to me is, is reframing the question. And it's not what, how much time or effort or money does it take to get this going, but it's really what is the risk of not having a program in place. You know, how many projects do you are you not qualified for before you you start to think this is important? I mean, to me if you lose if you lose one project, you're going to offset any cost or time effort that it would take to get a program up and um, up and running. Uh, our employees are our most valuable part of the organization. I mean, how 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 many people do you want to lose to uh, attrition or how much institutional knowledge is it worth risking losing by not having programs in, in place that engage uh, engage your employees. 
And how many people want to work in an organization that would rather have less transparency than more? You know, these are all risks that have real dollars associated with them, whether it's lost revenue, whether it's open positions, whether it's the hiring and the having to spend six months to ramp somebody up or the loss of, of institutional knowledge. So that's really the key takeaway, right? ESG is a business strategy that helps win more work. It can help you attract and retain talent, and it can guide your company to perform better. I don't know why we wouldn't want to have more information about how all aspects of our organizations are performing. Construction is nothing but, a, but an environment of continuous improvement uh, and, and lean practices, and ESG is just a driver of that. And it's, it's, if it's not already, it soon, it soon perhaps will be that businesses that don't have an ESG strategy are going to be at a competitive disadvantage from their peers. And so just to recap uh, where we where we came from, we want to start out, if you're starting to get our ESG program, we want to identify our scope, whether that's an individual office, whether that's a region, whether that's our entire organization. We want to benchmark the data we have. We want to start with our tier one data that is uh, easily acceptable and slowly build that out. But we want to capture a, a good 12 to 18 month benchmark of historical performance so that we can know where we stand. We wanna then use that information to begin to set goals so that we can uh, know what we are working towards. And then finally, we're gonna take those data analytics of how of the information we captured, and we're gonna use that to decide which tactics are most appropriate to reach those goals. And then we're gonna to continue to track and measure and see where we're having success and see where we're having challenges. And it's a process, again, of continuous improvement uh, and we will continue to work through uh, this program. Uh, and at some point, as you mature through there, we're going to cycle back. And if we just started with tier one metrics, we're going to start the process again with tier two metrics, where we'll capture that information, we'll benchmark, we'll analyze, and we'll implement tactics. So again, no matter where you are on your ESG journey, it's a con constant evolution throughout uh, the life cycle of your program. With that, uh, I'll wrap up. We do have a resource, a free resource available. It is the General Contractor's Guide to ESG Implementation. You can find it on our website at Get Green Badger. Uh, just go to the Resources tab and you will see it there, or the direct hyperlink is backslash resources, backslash ESG guide. Uh, and again, it, de it details the process that we talked about here. It's got a whole uh, addendum that's chock full of um, various options of tier one, tier two, and tier three metrics. It's got some suggestions on tactics uh, and really, again, it's hopefully a free resource. We'd love feedback on it. If you've got other ideas on how we can improve it after you've had time to review it, please don't hesitate. My contact information is on the screen. But with that, I will pause and see if uh, we've got any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tommy. We've got lots of great questions in the chat. Um, by the way, guys, you can click on the link on the screen to download that guide. Um, and let's start with the first one here. What if you don't have a dedicated department? How can you enhance your sustainability strategy? Is there an easy place to start? So if you don't have, uh, we've, we've, I've seen this a couple of ways. Again, I mean, part of it still comes down to getting that uh, executive buy-in. And at least if you don't have a person who's titled it, just ensuring that you do have, uh, I don't want to say chartered, a chartered group, but having some way that you know, this, this can seem like it is uh, authorized by the higher ups, because otherwise it's like, okay, I've got to do nine hours of, of work. And then what we don't want is that, sustainability becomes a bolt-on or an add-on. You know, it shouldn't just be like, I have to do this, this, and this. Oh, and I have to do sustainability. Um, from my experience, I've seen that uh, as a challenging way to ensure long-term success. But if you can get it where, you know, it's implicitly supported by senior leadership, it, it helps empower other people. It's really hard to go to the person in the cube next to you and say, hey, I need you to help me with this if, you know, they don't know that there is support towards that initiative. So I think it can be done. Uh, certainly without a titled person, I think that just makes that team all that more important because, you know, if, if everybody can do it for 10 minutes a day, that adds up to a full-time job uh, once you get a handful of people in there. But really helping to get that leadership support, and that's where building that business case of why is this important, um, 
really can help help with that success. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and Caitlin says, how does ESG impact the supply chain? So uh, that just tends to be one of those further tiers uh, that I talked about earlier. So you know, for us, we would say, you know, start internally. Once you've got your own processes worked out, then certainly supply chain becomes part of it. And again, it really depends on how far you want to go. What we're, what we're seeing in the construction world is, is, again, they're starting with questionnaires. Do you have a program to, to reduce waste? Are you tracking carbon in what scopes? And right now it's informative so that the people then who are uh, making decisions on who they want to hire are saying, okay, they've got this. That's great. What we've seen in, in safety is that they then use that as a score. And so they look at all your incidents. And if you have a lot of safety incidents, you have a lower score. And then as they go to hire, they say, look, if you're not above this threshold of a safety score, we're not going to hire you. And so, you know, you can certainly apply that same uh, strategy towards your own supply chain where, you know, if there's vendors that have more sustainable products, they, they are a higher priority than vendors that don't or if they have programs in place. So I would say it's something you would want to mature into or maybe your company is there already. But I, I think the same the same things that they're asking of us as suppliers in the construction industry, we can then ask of our own supply chain. Um, and there's plenty of examples of, of ESG surveys and sustainability surveys to get you started. Um, and I could certainly send you one. I think we've got some handy here if, if you needed one as well. But it's you know, it just starts that same, same opportunities there. If you want to engage your supply chain and begin to ask those questions, you know, they, they are your vendor. And if they want to continue to be your vendor, uh, they're going to they're going to answer them. Absolutely. All right. And next one here. Thanks for the insight. Curious about your thoughts on what you see as the future impact of AI when it comes to creating a more sustainable construction environment. So AI is, is obviously the buzzword of the day, but I think there is a lot of opportunity. A lot of things, you know, if you if specifically if we start to look at embodied carbon, which is, uh, I think, sort of the next frontier of sustainable construction, there's just, you know, there's 50,000 concrete mixed designs out there and they all have various carbon emissions that are associated. And for humans to try and sit here and sift through that information, I think that that's the perfect example of where you can start use, use AI just to be able to process that vast amount of data uh, to make those de decision making easier. Because the you know I think a lot of people... That we all want to do the right thing. And if you just tell us what to use, we will use it. If there's a low carbon alternative that I don't have to go spend 500 hours researching, you know, just tell me. And as long as it's cost equivalent or similar, I'll use it. And I think that just due to the vast amount of data out there that AI is going to help help us make those decisions and be able to present those alternatives in a way that is actually manageable and can let us come to those decisions much quicker than if we're trying to do it on our own. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, simplicity, and uh, that's going to be a huge thing in us implementing this. Um, okay, let me just get this next question. How can we maximize sustainability in construction through innovative green building practices? Uh, I mean, there's a ton, tons of things you can do, right? So the, the challenge I see in construction, uh, the challenge we face is that a lot of times it's build this. The decision's been made already. Like I can't pick a lower embodied carbon structure. I didn't design it. You, somebody else already determined that this is a precast concrete building with this much parking. So then it becomes, you know, what can we do to help influence that? So part of it is, uh, I think when you start to see more integrated design and design build opportunities, it allows us in the construction world to, to get to the table earlier and, and have a say at that. So I think that's going to be as you're looking to truly advance sustainability, I think the the design bid build approach may 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 suffer versus a more collaborative approach to find those solutions. And I know some of the the contractors that I talk to um, will echo that that when they are really trying to advance sustainability, that it's much more challenging if they are not at the t at the table to begin with. If we start to look at what we what we can control. Um, then it begins to go, you know, I think if you look at a typical GC, right, 50 or 60 percent of our workforce is in the field. And that's really where we start to find opportunities of what are our job site practices. And this is where starting your ESG program can really help, because until you can understand what goes on on your job site, you know, what are we doing in our trailers? What are we doing for equipment? Can we electrify our equipment uh, instead of just waste diversion? What can we do for waste minimization to ensure that we're 
not just recycling waste, but that we're actually reducing the amount of waste. How do we stop idling emissions? I mean, there's all sorts. Again, that gets into the tactics side of things. What are we doing on a job site? So you know, I would say there, there's a plenty of tactics, but I would not jump over the, uh, the the benchmarking side of things. But again, that's where when we look at a program, it often starts in our office because that's easy. There's four walls, there's one utility bill. But it, the challenge we have as contractors is that a lot of our people are out in the field and we have hundreds of job sites that are all sort of differently. And so um, that that's a huge opportunity that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And as we round up uh, at the end of our session, I've got just a couple more questions for you. Um, how great of an impact do you predict construction materials will have on sustainability goals and expectations, primarily in terms of steel and timber usage? I think that to me, that comes back to an embodied carbon question. When you look at in, uh, when you look at a building and you and you model it, the vast majority of that embodied carbon is in the steel, is in the concrete. And so finding lower carbon uh, alternatives, whether that is something like mass timber, I think the jury might still be out a little bit on that, but uh, or lower carbon steel or concrete supplemental alternatives. I mean, that is the driving factor. We could have a carbon neutral ceiling tile, but it's like, OK, you know, that's one tenth of one percent of your building's. Um, impact. So again, back to like looking from scratch, those big ticket items of steel and concrete and, and how the industry can advance in those is really where we'll see the profound impacts. Awesome. Final question here. Uh, when do you see sustainable construction practices reaching a critical mass? I mean, yesterday, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I started this by saying that there's going to be 13,000 buildings built a day and it's, you know, the decisions we're making today, those buildings are I, hopefully going to be around a really long time. Hopefully they're not built with a, you know, a 20 year, we're going to build it and throw it away life cycle approach. So to me, this, we're, we're at a tipping point and we've got to, we've got to make those decisions uh, today to accelerate. And I think, again, we have seen green construction double in the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, and so we need it to double again, but it's got to be in the next five years versus the next 20 years, just because we'll have built hundreds of thousands of buildings by the time the next 20 years roll around. Awesome. Well, Tommy, I do want to thank you so much for joining us today for this Innovate to Build session. Uh, for everybody else attending, we hope it was meaningful and impactful. For you. If you haven't yet, head over to the of our Post your views on sustainability in the AEC. Three posts will win a $100 gift card on us. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.